Use the speakers. Uh, Michael Mastonduno graduated with a BA in physics from the Colorado College. He joined the optics in medicine lab at Dartmouth and is currently a PhD candidate working under uh, Dr. Brian Pogue. Mike's research focuses on developing alternative imaging modalities for detecting and characterization of breast cancer. Uh, <coughs> Not done yet. <laughs> uh, Paolo Giacometti is from Quito, Ecuador, where he lived until he attended St. Anselm College in New Hampshire. Uh, he graduated with a BA in Applied Physics and a minor in Computational Physical Sciences. He is currently a third year PhD candidate at Thayer School of Engineering, and he works with Dr. Solomon Diamond's Multimodal Neuroimaging Lab. Uh, please welcome our speakers. Thank you, Dr. Hartov. Uh, so today my talk will be on um, magnetic resonance guided near infrared spectroscopy for functional uh, and structural imaging of breast cancer. Before I begin, I'd like to um, acknowledge all of my colleagues at uh, Thayer School and at DHMC, my funding agencies, and of course, my peers and Dr. Hartov for giving me the opportunity to speak to you guys today uh, at this seminar. So, I'm going to be talking about breast cancer. And uh, in the last year, breast cancer was um, one of the most diagnosed cancers in women. In fact, it was the most diagnosed, uh, with almost a quarter million new diagnoses just last year. Uh, it's the second leading um, cause of death from cancer uh, behind lung cancer in women, according to the American Cancer Society. And uh, because there are so many cases of, of cancer diagnosed, um, there's really a lot of awareness. In fact, October, as you might know, is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and so the NFL had all their players in pink gloves and cleats uh, with ribbons on the field. And the, the ribbon has really become a symbol of um, breast cancer awareness and supporting fighting against it. Uh, and it's not just a, a, a national thing. It's uh, international as well, um, with these buildings in India having pink lights um, to support breast cancer awareness. So with so much uh, prevalence, there's really a, a big call for uh, early detection and treatment. Um, and clinical mammography is really the standard of care in that respect. And so I'm going to put up some images of mammograms, which are just you know an x-ray image through the breast. And um, when you look at them, if you don't have an MD and some training in radiology, it can be pretty hard to see any abnormalities because they usually just look like um, faint shadows uh, here or you know, interesting tissue morphology that looks pretty much the same to me. Um, but there's, there's a very large um, effort to screen uh, women because it's well known that early diagnosis is the key to survival. And breast cancer with an early diagnosis is really a very treatable cancer. Um, so we work hard. And if you look at this graph of uh, time versus cumulative survival, the different curves show uh, when certain people were diagnosed and uh, how, they, how long they last. Um, and the earliest diagnoses are really you know, the, the best uh, chance for survival. Unfortunately, for mammography, one of the biggest problems um, is that it doesn't do very well in dense breast tissue, uh, which is typical in younger women. Um, and it's also doubly bad for mammography that women with dense breasts tend to have uh, higher cancer rates. And mammography has a lower specificity, which means, and uh, a lower sensitivity as well. And so that means it's not as good as at detecting cancers in dense breasts and it's not as good at characterizing them. And so there have been a lot of improvements to mammography over the years, first with just lower radiation levels and then moving to digital film instead of uh, regular film. Uh, and lately, there's been an effort to move to 3D mammography, which can produce an image stack instead of just a single x-ray image. But really, the, the best improvement on mammography is to use MRI, which in, improves sensitivity drastically. MRI is a, a volumetric imaging modality. It has a very high resolution, uh, almost approaching a millimeter or better. It's effective in dense tissue and non-dense tissue alike. 
And it has a high sensitivity, reported sometimes at 100%, depending on what you read. Of course, it has its limitations as well. Uh, the specificity of MR is much lower, to 35 to 80%, depending on the publication. And the cost is very high. So on the left here, we just have an image stack being scrolled through. And on the right, we can, we can do a maximum intensity projection to see the, just the 3D nature of, of MR imaging. MR is very good at distinguishing um, adipose and glandular tissue. So adipose is the lighter, the fatty tissue. And the glandular tissue would be the, the darker tissue. It's very good at telling cysts and inflammation from healthy tissue. Um, and in some cases, it, it's much better than mammography in detecting lesions. Uh, here's a case where the mammogram has no detectable lesion. And I don't mean not detectable to me, because most of them are not detectable to me, but to a radiologist. Um, whereas MR was able to find two seven millimeter lesions in this patient. The problem with MR, however, is again, going back to this limitation, is the, the specificity is very low. And so that means whatever MR finds, it's in, un, incapable of classifying a certain suspicious region very well. And so what we end up with is a lot of different cancers that are biopsied for no reason. And so to really to think about how we might improve on that, we've got to look at cancer physiology. And so some, some really important things about cancer physiology are the increased vascularity. So a, a tumor will, will have a lot of vasculature, more vessels. They'll have hypoxic regions, because that vasculature is usually not well distributed. And for the same reason, there'll be heterogeneous blood flow. Um, and then those vessels are also going to have an increased uh, permeability, so things can pass in and out of them. Um, much easier than a healthy vessel. And so in a, in a normal uh, tissue arrangement, you might see a well-organized lay of, uh, of arteries, veins, or of arteries, capillaries, and veins. But then in, a, in this cartoon tumor, um, they're all kind of jumbled, and you can't tell what's what. Um, and so we, we can use different imaging modalities to see this, these changes in soft tissue. So ultrasound will use uh, sound wave propagation through a medium. And you can see a tumor as a, as a darker area. Or MR can use the magnetic field relaxation to see a tumor. Um, and then x-ray mammography will use x-ray attenuation. But the problem is that these modalities, the contrast is really very small with the, with the soft tissue. And when we're imaging, we want a high signal to noise. And we also want a high contrast, if we can get it. So with these three modalities, we might use uh, contrast agents, like gadolinium to an MR to be able to see uh, what we're trying to see better. Um, but a lot of these agents can be uh, toxic, and we'd rather not use them. So what we're really looking for is an imaging modality that has higher intrinsic contrast. And so in this graph of kind of resolution versus contrast, um, you see that x-ray mammography has very good resolution, uh, but the contrast you get is pretty low. And same with MRI and ultrasound. Whereas this modality called NIR imaging, which I happen to know something about, um, has a very, very good intrinsic contrast uh, comparatively. And the reason for that is because NIR imaging is based on essentially blood attenuation. Now, we can send light through tissue. And if you look at visible light at 400 nanometers, you know, there's a ton of blood absorption. And so you can't really see light. You know, you're not seeing light coming through me. Um, but if I were to shine light that's in the 700s through a smaller area of tissue, like maybe my finger or my hand or even a, um, you know, a woman's breast, you'd be able to see that light. And so we can use that light to uh, take advantage of the different physiology in, in the tumors and get good maps of blood content. So near-infrared spectroscopic imaging has been around for a couple decades now. Um, and so in this particular case, it's being used for neoadjuvant chemotherapy monitoring, which is um, a treatment pre-surgery for very aggressive breast cancers. And so if we have the patient would get their screening mammogram, um, and this, this imaging modality then is non-invasive and non inexpensive, and it monitors the hemodynamic content. Uh, and it has a spatial resolution that's worse than all of those other modalities, but it's still about half a centimeter. Um, so this woman in treatment would have a pre-treatment MRI. And then we can look at the pre-treatment optical scan, where we can see uh, total hem hemoglobin, which is blood content, 
oxygen saturation and water content uh, before treatment. And then because near-infrared imaging is non-invasive and inexpensive, we can also do a during treatment where we can see this, this tumor region in the hemoglobin has gotten smaller. And we can do an after treatment as well, um, where the, the cancer is totally gone in this case. And we can see that on the MRI as well, uh, with this patient being a complete responder. Now, we see a pre and a post treatment MRI, um, but near infrared imaging here gives us the opportunity to really uh, monitor during therapy. And if we wanted to, we could have imaged several more times as well uh, to see if we needed to change drugs or um, if the patient was going to respond. So how do we do this? Optical imaging uses uh, lasers in the red area of the spectrum to um, image breasts. And so we send laser light into a breast and measure it. We fit it to a diffusion model. So light travels through tissue, much like milk travels in coffee, kind of diffusive. Uh, and we'll look at that more later. Um, we can make a sensitivity map of how our, uh, how our how our sources and detectors are sensitive to what tissue. And finally, we come out with our images. And so the thing you have to remember is that optical imaging really quantifies absorption and scatter. And so when we look at uh, red light being shined through someone's hand, we can see you know, it's very bright here, one to two centimeters of tissue penetration. But then as we get further away, um, the light is kind of, it kind of falls off, and we see much less of it. So we can use light detectors to see that. But we can also see that there's, you know, there's an absorption spectra with several different spectral features, like deoxygenated hemoglobin comes through here, and oxygenated hemoglobin through here. And then water and lipids uh, have spectral features over at the higher end of the around 900 and 1,000 nanometers. So we can get information from the absorption spectrum in the light. But then the other thing you should notice about this is that it's not like a point source is sent in and we get a point source out. We're getting a very diffused area of light. And so it's not like X-ray imaging at all, where a low scatter, uh, light, where a low scatter beam is passed through the, the medium. In X-ray, you, know, you, can, you can see the beam mostly gets to the detector. And we can essentially use attenuation uh, as our metric for a contrast. But in optical imaging, that's not the case. Because the wavelength of light is similar to the size of your organelles and, and your cells, the light will scatter whenever it hits one of these. And so it might change direction slightly. Um, and it's equally probable that it'll go the other direction. And that happens about once per millimeter in tissue. So uh, scattering really has to be accounted for. Because if you look at this, these two pictures have the same light intensity going in. But the detector is seeing something very different because of the scattering. So in order to have optical imaging even work, we need a way to separate absorption and scatter. And my project uses a, one technique called a frequency domain approach, which is where the input laser signal is modulated um, at a frequency. And we can look at the recovered signal uh, and compare it to a reference to see the change in amplitude, which would uh, be correlated with absorption, and the, the change in phase shift, which is kind of like a, a delay in the tissue. And that would correspond to scatter. Um, I'd also like to mention that I don't work at this, in this building. Um, a lot of the engineering school does. Um, a lot of the engineering school works other places. But I work in a, in a basement in the hospital. And we really have a lot of great opportunities down there. So I just wanted to say, first, that clinical projects require wide collaboration. So we have a typical graduate researcher, such as myself. And I have uh, two very outstanding uh, advisors who work here. But then I also have help from other people at the Thayer School. And um, I, I'm very dependent on my radiologists who are at DHMC. We also have people in surgery, pathology. We have people in patient recruiting. And we have people in MR acquisition. And we really need all of these people need to come together to be able to do this project. So this isn't going to be one person's work by any means. I work in the Advanced Imaging Center at DHMC which is a, a pretty large area on the second floor of the hospital. That's down in the basement by um, oncology. And so we have a, an MRI in there. It's a dedicated three Tesla research MRI scanner. Um, we have an image processing section, which is where I do a lot of my image processing for a near infrared spectroscopy MRI uh, human breast imaging. 
There's an animal prep room for uh, animal surgeries. Uh, our lab has a uh, near-infrared imager uh, for small animals. We also, across the hall, have different research projects working on clinical breast imaging and lab space. There's a second MRI planned for um, this area. And just recently, we're starting construction on an advanced surgical suite, um, which will be an extension to the hospital. And probably only a handful of these facilities exist in the world where we'll have an intraoperative CT and an intraoperative MR. Um, so there'll be some really exciting opportunities for research going on in that room in the, in the next uh, five or 10 years. So my system is MR guided. So some of it is housed outside the MR control suite, and some of it's housed inside the MR suite where the patients are actually imaged. And so that's a challenge because we can't have any metal or electronics or anything in the MR room. So we can deal with that problem pretty easily by putting the system outside. And the system is going to have you know, a computer, RF signal generators to modulate the lasers, a detector array to actually measure the light, and data acquisition. Uh, and we can deal with the problem of not having electronics in the MR room by sending optical fibers through a hole in the wall and then to under, uh, coupled into the patient. So we can use fiber optics to move the light in and out of the MR room, and everything else can live outside the MR room. So that's pretty elegant. To actually do this patient imaging, we set up the patient on top of uh, a custom magnetic resonance breast coil. So this coil is, is responsible for the MR signals that steer the RF fields. Um, we can couple our optical fiber into the, into the coil so that it's it, in contact with the patient's breast, and we can deliver and collect light. And so when we're ready to image, uh, looking down on the coil, uh, the breast tissue might be here, and we can turn the lights off, let the MR run, and we can deliver light through one source and measure through all the other fibers, and then move on to the next source, deliver through all the other fibers. And we can do that through every source fiber. So we end up with about 240 measurements um, per patient. And all the while, the MR is doing its clinical MR exam. So this is really being developed as an adjunct uh, to complement clinical MRI. Now, one problem was that we had only a few, uh, 240 data points is a lot, but we'd like to have more. So one of the first projects I did here was to uh, improve our, our patient interface for volumetric imaging. So I have a picture of it here, which you probably can't really get much out of, but um, it, it gives a vertical degree of freedom to our interface, which is something that we didn't have before. It's flexible for positioning in different MR coils. Every different MR has a different MR coil geometry. And so we use a parallel plate geometry, uh, which is just two parallel arrays of fibers to, um, to help with that. It's remotely controllable from outside the MR room uh, with the system. And it maintains a good fiber contact with the patient, which is important for our modeling. Um, in the coil, you can't really see that it looks any different. But from the side, you can see it has these airbags. Um, and it, you know, if, if the patient's breast comes through this hole, uh, it holds it in place nice and rigidly with some light compression. Um, and the main benefit, again, is that vertical degree of freedom um, where we can actually remotely control and move the fibers up and down from outside the MR room. And part of that was to validate that it was still working. So you know, if we had a linearly changing ink concentration in the well, could we get a linearly changing uh, recovered images? And yes, we can. So this project was successful. We also looked at uh, our contrast recovery in 3D. So we can use op optical phantoms made of gelatin and animal blood um, to try and essentially make an inclusion with or a, a higher absorbing region that's the simulated cancer. Um, and that would, and then we can measure it and hope we get the same thing back. And so in this case, we, we tried to see what the, the new patient interface's volumetric capabilities were. And so we measured at all these different planes of data, and we were able to reconstruct images based on each plane and then the combined. And more data, lo and behold, yields better results. And this work is all published in the Journal of Biomedical Optics. So one thing we have to look at is, in the clinical progression, where can we really make a difference? And so there's screening mammography, which affects most of the population um, over 50, is the recommendation now. Uh, and it was just changed from over 40, but we can get into that later. 
So yeah, it's recommended annually and uh, representative mammograms here. And so if there's a suspicious area as diagnosed by the radi radiologist, there'll be callback patient for more mammography or ultrasound or MRI. And during that, you know, we'll use, they'll use magnified views on the mammography or spot compression. Uh, and then they might also use different modalities because, like I said before, different modalities are going to show different, um, different things in the physiology. And if necessary, you know, we can do, they'll do a biopsy. Um, and so most biopsies are going to be ultrasound guided, but they can also be uh, tactile if the tumor is palpable, and they can uh, also be MR and X-ray guided. And so I have an uh, ultrasound with a biopsy needle here, um, and then that, the sample that's removed from the core of the suspicious region would go to pathology and histology to be um, analyzed. So then based, if there is a cancer, based on the um, aggressiveness of the cancer, and the size and the, the age of the patient, um, we might see neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and then we'll usually, and then there'll be surgery, uh, and that can be a, a partial reduction or a full reduction um, of the tissue, just to, to keep the breast cancer from spreading to other parts of the body through the lymph system or the or the blood vessels. And so, when we look at where our role is in all this, we have to think about you know what, you know how who are we benefiting and how much does it cost. And so my technology isn't really going to make sense to benefit screening population because MR is very expensive. And so I'm using MR as a, a combined modality, and it costs a lot more than $100 a scan. So I can't really do that. Um, we could screen high-risk groups, which benefits less people, but still a lot, or diagnosis following an abnormal mammogram. And so that would affect those previously screened and probably looking at about $1,000 a scan. And so now we're getting closer to where I might fit in. And finally, we can integrate into clinical systems, which seems to fit our mold. And then finally, uh, monitoring therapy, which affects only the small group of cancer patients. And scan costs can be much higher, so we have a lot more room to work with. And so we like to say that we fit, we'll fit in anywhere in this area, uh, also in integration. Um, and in the clinical standpoint, we'd probably end up in here somewhere, which would be pr before biopsy, we'd be able to give more information um, to, the, about, to the radiologists. So one thing we can do is we really, we're using the MR and the optics together, and so we really want to be able to use them uh, in a synergistic relationship. So one thing we can do is uh, use the, the spatial prior information, which is very good from MR, to help guide the optical uh, reconstructions, which are not very good spatially, but they are good functionally. So one can help the other. So in a, in a typical uh, clinical exam, we'll see uh, a 90-second MR pre-scan, and then uh, a gadolinium contrast agent will be administered, and then there'll be uh, five 90-second post-contrast scans at equally spaced intervals. And so each of those scans will come up with uh, a tissue volume, like the one we looked at earlier. And we can, we can look at any of those scans and kind of say, you know, the, pre, or the post scan minus the pre-scan at every pixel should give us some intuition about which pixels are enhancing the most. Uh, and since c cancers are going to have a higher vasculature, we would expect them to enhance more. And so we can, we can then segment that tissue out based on uh, where our tumor is, our glandular tissue, and the adipose tissue. We can make a mesh to represent that volume, uh, and then numerically uh, solve an inverse problem on the computer to come up with a final image for blood content or um, oxygen saturation or other parameters. And so there's another way we can do it as well, since if we look at uh, one slice from all of these we can see that as it goes, you know, this, it's getting brighter, but it's getting brighter in different areas. So one thing we can do, and this method was first proposed by uh, Paul Toft um, a while ago, we can look at the kinetics of how these, these pixels enhance. And so a normal enhancement curve will look something like this. There's an abnormal enhancement curve will look quite a bit different. And so if we, if we make a map of what's called the K-trans and um, fit for these parameters, K, which is permeability, and V, which is the, liquid, the leakage space between vessels, we can get a pretty clear picture of uh, 
of where our tumor might be in the pink. And, and that's actually the clinical standard uh, used today in radiology. So one, one thing we wonder is, if we have our MR image and we want to use these segmented tissue volumes to do this, we can use the subtraction and we can use this K-trans method. And yeah, there's going to be some difference between the two, but how much does it really make, uh, matter? And so we did a quick study to come up with uh, that, and we found that the clinical standards are better. Uh, radiologist guidance helps a lot, and overestimating the size yields less error in the long run. We can also incorporate spectral priors, so we can image at different wavelengths and use the ratios of these uh, signals to kind of pick out the different spectral features and separate the different um, types of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Uh, we can fit those to our diffusion model and come up with a solution uh, that's really fused together with the MRI. Talk about that. And so in the clinic so far, we've done a variety of different things. Uh, we've, we've done it where we have a known malignancy and we're trying to characterize uh, the, that malignancy. So in this patient, we, we see where our optical measurement plane is here, corresponding with this coronal MR slice. Uh, and we can get total hemoglobin and oxygen saturation water maps um, overlaid on the MR. We can get 3D. And we've also used this, this system to monitor uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, where this woman came in multiple times during her treatment. Uh, and she was, uh, we monitored her, her with MR and with optics. Uh, as kind of a demonstration of what we could do. So we can do that, but we don't want to. Um, we've also looked at fluorescence imaging, uh, which is just a different type of imaging. So we've got a, a nice study here showing that um, we can do in vivo fluorescence imaging, which is something that's only really been done in uh, small animals and in a collection, a couple of other institutions. Um, and so, of course, we just, we're always imaging normal subjects, and I'm running out of time, so I just want to skip through to the conclusions. Okay. And so in this, we're really looking at uh, system validation is, is ongoing always. Uh, and so we'll do that with phantom studies and healthy volunteers. Um, we're also going to look at system improvements. So we'll be simplifying the software and automating the calibration so that future students or clinicians can use it. Um, and then, of course, we're always looking for more cancer patients to kind of validate. And this system is in a preclinical trial right now. Um, we're also looking to, to showcase our volumetric imaging to do more cases with fluorescence, like we saw really briefly. And we've also got a, an indocyanin in green uh, study that's, that's on, the, uh, on the horizon. And then, of course, there's also graduation to think about, but who's thinking about that? So again, I'd like to thank uh, all my colleagues, especially Keith, Brian, and Shudong here at the Thayer School, Roberta at the, the, Norris Con at the DHMC, my funding agencies, the National Institute of Health, the National Cancer Institute, and the National Science Foundation. And um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Paolo. Thanks for your attention. I'm uh, Paolo Giacometti. I uh, work at uh, the Multimodal Neuroimaging Lab under Professor Salmon Diamond. Um, and I'm going to talk about our research project, which has been uh, the development of a head probe for combined near infrared spectroscopy, which Mike was just talking about, and uh, electroencephalography. I will start uh, going over uh, some background information on neurovascular coupling and some diseases associated with it. Uh, then I will go on to the design and performance of um, this uh, near-infrared and e-electroencephalography uh, probe. I will uh, talk about the work, done that we've, uh, the work that we have done, and I will finish with the, the work that's left. 
Um, neurovascular coupling um, talks about the relationship between neural function and vascular hemodynamics. Uh, when we have an area on, on the brain that is being activated, uh, there is a neural uh, response, a neural activity associated with that brain activity, and some uh, vascular hemodynamics or blood flow to that area of activity. Uh, so the relationship between this neural function and this blood flow to that area of activity is uh, referred to as the neurovascular coupling. Um, this increase in blood flow uh, in the area of activation occurs by many mechanisms occurring concurrently that um, aren't fully understood. Um, uh, in fact, uh, several diseases affect this neural function, uh, but also they affect this vascular or blood flow this act vascular activity and the relationship between the, the neural function and the activity. Uh, some of these uh, diseases are very prominent in the world, such as Alzheimer's disease or stroke. Um, Alzheimer's disease uh, is a type of dementia that causes a graduate loss of memory and cognitive function uh, by damaging and destroying uh, neurons. It is the number one leading cause of dementia and an estimated 5.4 million people worldwide are affected by it. Um, it is the sixth most common cause of death across all ages and the, sixth, the fifth in, in amongst the elderly. Um, it is a very costly disease. It uh, costs up annually about $183 billion, and it is projected to raise to $1.1 trillion by the year 2050. Um, in fact, uh, over that, uh, nearly 15 million Americans provide unpaid care to people with Alzheimer or uh, some other type of dementia. This means that this projected cost and this annual cost uh, right now it is, is potentially significantly higher uh, because of all these people who are not getting paid for their care they provide. Similarly for stroke, uh, which is a block of blood supply uh, caused by a clot uh, or a bleed in the vasculature or in the blood vessels surrounding or inside the brain. Uh, an estimated 15 million people worldwide are affected by this every year. Um, five million of these people recover from it. Five million are permanently disabled and the rest die. Uh, in the US alone, it is the third leading cause of death and it is the number one leading cause of permanent disabilities. Um, on average, uh, someone has a stroke every 40 seconds here. Um, so they are pretty costly and, and they affect a lot of people. This has uh, created this societal need for tools uh, to study uh, a non-invasive and cost-effective way uh, this neurovascular coupling uh, and uh, the diseases associated with this neurovascular coupling. Um, for the case of this neurovascular relationship, there is a requirement for a tool that measures the neural activity and the vascular activity simultaneously. Uh, for the case of uh, neurovascular diseases, uh, we need tools to study the effectiveness of new treatments and new drugs that are de being developed. Um, in fact, these two diseases uh, affect the neurovascular physiology. They, they don't only affect the neural function, but they also affect the vascular function and the relationship between the two. And studying these three areas that the diseases affect is uh, it's important to the future. Um, future multimodal studies, uh, and by multimodal, I mean uh, the combination of several systems that measure several uh, signals in the, in the head, uh, such as the neural and the vascular signal. Uh, future multimodal studies of the neurovascular relationship could lead to breakthroughs in our understanding of neurological disorders and improve our diagnosis and treatment. So for that, we need a multimodal probe, uh, an advanced technology for multimodal neuroimaging. Um, this would increase our understanding of the neurovascular relationship, and it would allow for study of neural activity, cerebrovascular activity, and their correlation. But in order to do this, we need, to, we need a probe that uh, it is non-invasive, that is cost-effective so that it can be deployed to society uh, on a large scale, hopefully. It needs to measure neural activity. It needs to measure cerebrovascular activity. 
and it needs to, uh, sorry, it needs to integrate uh, proven capabilities of existing neural and vascular imaging technologies. This means it needs to use systems that are currently used and have been shown to, to measure these signals. So for that, uh, we proposed a near-infrared spectroscopy and electroencephalography probe. It combines these two systems, uh, EEG, or electroencephalography, uh, which uses these uh, electrodes or electrical terminals placed throughout the surface of the scalp uh, to measure electric potentials from uh, neural currents. In a similar fashion, uh, near-infrared spectroscopy uh, for, for brain imaging, uh, it places optical terminals or optodes throughout the surface of the scalp uh, to measure uh, cerebral blood oxygen dynamics in the forms of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. Um, so our nearest EEG probe would place these electrodes and these optodes throughout the surface of the scalp uh, in a way that, uh, that is standard so that clinicians can, can interpret those signals. Um, and ultimately, this, this probe would provide simultaneous measurement of, of nurse and EEG, meaning simultaneous vascular and neural signals. Uh, for this, we have several uh, features that we propose that are included in this probe uh, that can be uh, put into three main categories, uh, one dealing with human interface, uh, multimodal compatibility, and product design and manufacturing. On the human interface side, we aim to, to design a probe that has good optical and electrical coupling, meaning that the connection between these optodes and electrodes and the surface of the scalp is good, so we get good signal. We aim to have something that is stable during head movements, that doesn't cause damage to skin, that is easy to use and to affect, and that it minimizes discomfort to the patient. Uh, on the multimodal compatibility side, not only do we aim to combine these two systems, EEG and NERSE, into one single device, but also we aim to create something that uh, has, is, is fabricated with materials that are com compatible with magnetoencephalogram, or MEG, and magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. We aim to design it to be low profile enough so that it fits in an MRI or an MEG machine, and we aim to, to place these optodes and electrodes uh, following a standard placement so that clinicians can, can actually interpret the signals and so that each position of each uh, optical and electrical terminal corresponds to a, a, uh, an area of the brain that is known. Uh, finally, on the product design and manufacturing side, we aim to create something that is reusable, that is durable, that is and that is low cost and easy to fabricate so that it can be mass produced and eventually deployed to society at a large scale. So the main, the main uh, design problem that this poses is, is placing all these optodes and electrodes uh, throughout the surface of the head in an efficient way uh, and following a standard arrangement. Um, so what we propose is, uh, what we have here with the black dots is uh, the standardized electrode 1020 placement, which is what's used uh, commonly clinically. We, had ad we have advanced on that system uh, where the yellow dots here are uh, an another set of electrodes that double the density, so we cover a larger amount of, of the surface of the scalp. And then we combine with the red and the blue uh, uh, dots, which are uh, the optode sources and detectors for the near infrared spectroscopy system. In this way, we follow this 1020 arrangement that is standardized on EEG. We expand on it, and then we follow that same arrangement for the optical side. So, after several iterations on design, we have come up with this design, which is a computer aided rendering of the nearest EEG probe that we see here. It is mainly consists of a hemispherical structure of these uh, linked arms uh, that, are, that are the basis, uh, are the structure of this head probe, and uh, with a layer of an elastomeric or silicone rubber web that is placed on top. Now, these two, between this, this structure and this web, uh, we, ha we hold all these electrodes that are, that are in the axis of the structure and sometimes in the middle of the web. 
and all these optodes, which are tiny, but you can see the fiber optics coming off of it uh, in yellow, throughout the surface of the scalp in, in the, following the arrangement that we had proposed. Um, furthermore, this, this structure and the web expand and contract uniformly uh, so that uh, the distance between electrodes or optodes remains relatively the same when the probe is expanded or contracted. This gives us uh, the option of using it in a very wide range of head sizes and shapes and to be able to use it in the general population. This, uh, this structural uh, expansion and contraction uh, allows us to keep the standard arrangement and uh, accurate positioning of all these electrodes and optodes regardless of the head size or shape that we're placing it on. Um, so uh, to arrive to this point, we have gone through several design iterations. Here we have the three main prototypes that we designed and fabricated. Uh, we ran some performance tests on them, and uh, we ran uh, neuroimaging tests on two of them. Um, and finally, we filed patents uh, both on the basic concepts and features behind the probe design and uh, the specifications and, and the design and the details of each of the components. Here on the last picture, we can see the, it's the actual fabricated uh, head probe from the CAD rendering from this slide before. So after that, we ran a performance test to be able to evaluate the, the capabilities and the performance of this head probe to be able to characterize how it works. And we obtained simultaneous EEG and nurse measurements during two main conditions, uh, during eyes open and uh, normal breathing, and uh, during eyes closed deep breathing condition. Um, these two conditions are, are normally studied uh, for EEG and for nurse, um, uh, because the signals that are obtained during these two conditions are different on both the EEG side and the nurse side. So we are able to to identify whether the signal that we obtained is actually uh, corresponds to the physiology in the brain. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and the results that we obtained are, are very encouraging. Here we have a, a top view of a head, and the two regions that we focused our experiment on, with uh, the yellow region corresponding to the EEG, or neural signal, that we measured up top and the red uh, regions corresponding to the vascular signal or the nurse signal that we obtained in the bottom. Uh, we measured from both right and left hemisphere, uh, so uh, we divided the, the graphs on both left and right. Now, right away, we can see several things. Um, here on each of these uh, graphs, we have two figures, uh, a time domain and a frequency domain uh, for all of, of the measurements. And one of the things that we can observe is that the frequency of, on, the, on the data is very different on the neural side than on the vascular side. Here, uh, the, the, the time uh, domain plot is only two seconds, and we have a very busy waveform. And it corresponds to just the green block here on the near-infrared side. So this is a much slower signal than the EEG signal. Um, and then uh, if we focus a little on, this, on these graphs uh, for the neural side, we have the, the on the y-axis, our electric potential measured in microvolts uh, from, with our EEG versus time, and then the power of the signal versus the frequency. Uh, and then we can distinguish two main activities uh, uh, in, this, in this signal. Uh, some beta activity or beta waves that are commonly seen in an EEG. Um, and this sensory motor rhythm at about 12 hertz uh, that is often called a mu rhythm uh, and is present on, on people who are inactive. Uh, so if a person is using any motor function, so it's moving or making any movements, this rhythm is absent. But as soon as the person is still, this rhythm uh, start, is, is visible. So this was a, a great result because since our subject was just standing still, during the period of the test, we, we were able to observe this rhythm, and it gives us uh, some, some physiologically relevant information. Um, uh, so we, we can, this, this uh, demonstrates that our probe is actually picking up a relevant information, good signal. 
Similarly, on the near-infrared side, we have our uh, deoxygenated hemoglobin on the blue and oxygenated hemoglobin on the red. And we have uh, the changes in hemoglobin on the y-axis versus time and the power of the signal uh, versus the frequency. Here we can pick out three main pulsations or three main activities, a respiratory pulsation, uh, a cardiac pulsation from the heart beating, and the harmonic of that. Uh, uh, we, can, we can see that about 0.4 hertz is this respiratory pulsation, and about 1.4, 1.5 is this cardiac pulsation. This is, this is also a very great result because these are two signals, uh, the respiration and, and uh, heartbeat, that are, that are uh, very common in the, in the blood, and we are actually being able to measure them and pick them out with this head probe. Um, so that was for the eyes open and normal breathing condition. So we got the same, uh, uh, the same uh, graphs for the second condition, where we get uh, the top view for the two regions and the same uh, type of, of graphs. But here, our results are slightly different. Uh, we do get that beta activity, those beta waves that are common. Um, we, we get that sensory motor or mu rhythm um, that we got before because our subject was still just uh, quietly and uh, not moving. But now we have another spike here from alpha activity or from alpha waves at about uh, 10, 8 hertz. Um, and, and this is an activity that is very commonly seen uh, when a subject has their eyes closed. Uh, this was very encouraging uh, uh, because uh, this is exactly what we expected uh, from the physiology and from other EEG studies. Uh, so being able to pick it out with our system was a very encouraging result. <coughs> Similarly, on the nurse, we see the same three pulsations that we saw before, a respiratory and cardiac pulsation and a harmonic. But these are slightly modified. Uh, the respiratory pulsation moved from about 0.4 hertz to about 0.1 or 0.2 hertz, which makes sense since on our deep breathing condition, uh, the breathing is much more controlled and slow. Uh, so seeing a, a variation from the first condition to this condition was very encouraging. A second, on the cardiac pulsation, we do have a peak, but it has broadened. Um, and this is, this is a, a good result as well because uh, when one is, is breathing deeply, the heartbeat is more irregular. Uh, so the frequencies that we pick out are, are, are more different, and this causes a broadening in the peak. Um, so this, these results were, were very good. It gave us a very encouraging results of how the probe is, is performing. And it, it gave us a measure of how we can actually pick out physiologically relevant data uh, with this probe. Uh, so. Uh, there's been a lot of work to get to this point, but there's still uh, some work to be done. Uh, on the short term, we need to test and evaluate the head probe with respect to head movement and geometric uncertainty. We need to, to test it on different head sizes and shapes. Uh, we need to determine the resolution of the signal that, that, we, that we obtain. And we need to quantify motion artifacts and noise that we get from the system. All of this, we're going to test against uh, state-of-the-art uh, equipment, uh, probably uh, EEG separately from NERS um, to be able to characterize our system against something that is already established. And on, on the long term, we are working towards a pilot clinical study on stroke patients so that we can start gathering some data on, on uh, people with these diseases. And uh, we are going to continue dialogue with some companies for commercialization of this head probe so that we can hopefully uh, deploy it to society and have uh, clinicians and research labs uh, testing with it. Um, so with that, I'm going to finish. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the rest of my neuroimaging lab, uh, particularly Brad Ficker, who's the one who was helping me out with uh, the testing for the performance of this probe. Um, and these are some of the references I used. Thank you.
Um, so uh, the, the question is, uh, what, what, are the, what are the future uses and uh, the, the future information that can be gathered with this probe? And uh, the, the answer is, is uh, everything that is currently done with electroencephalography and near-infrared spectroscopy uh, can be measured with this device. And then also, uh, we're trying to, to uh, combine these two so that the, the relationship between these two signals can be studied. Um, and uh, we're aiming to deploy this into society uh, on a large scale so that uh, clinicians everywhere and research labs can study all sorts of things. Uh, we are trying, our particular research lab is trying to focus on these uh, neurological diseases. But uh, this system can be used to study several other things. And uh, we do want to share this uh, so, that they, so that other people can study other, other diseases and other, other things uh, in the brain um, and hopefully get a lot more results. And, and hopefully, we can get a better understanding of, of uh, what is going on, of the neurovascular coupling, and hopefully develop new treatments and drugs uh, for diseases. Um, well, you know, there's, there's kind of, there's, there's two camps of people in, in the screening argument. Some say it's, it's not worth the money to screen for the benefit, and others say the screening is the key to early diagnosis and we have to do it. Uh, what I meant is dispensing with how it's done now. I with how it's done. I have objection to screening, but some women object to the way it is done. Uh, well, you know, the latest mammography is the 3D tomosynthesis mammography, and it's done mostly the same way. Um, so at, at the moment, no, I don't think x-ray imaging is going to become friendlier, but, um, you know, it's definitely possible that we'll replace it with something better. I also had a question for you, uh, uh, Paolo. You go ahead first, please. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I Right, uh, so the, the main aim of this is to study this relationship. It's to study the relationship between these signals. And hopefully, we can not only combine these two modalities, but also MRI or MEG in the future, and do even more modalities to understand the relationship between more signals. Um, for these experiments, uh, we just ran some analysis uh, independently. Um, and we just temporarily saw that they were recorded simultaneously. Um, for lack of time, we didn't do any more correlations. Uh, but, but yeah, that, that is the, the main point of, uh, and purpose of this, is to find these correlations between these signals. <laughs> Right, so for, for this particular experiment, what we wanted to do is we wanted to test the capabilities of the probe. So we wanted to show that it's actually working. We weren't really exploring the signals themselves and what they were telling us. We were just looking to see whether it was actually showing us physiology or not. Um, but, but yeah, that is actually the purpose of this probe. And, and uh, this pilot clinical study that we're starting within uh, this month, or hopefully the, as, early as, uh, as early as next month, um, we'll be studying that uh, in stroke patients. So we will be running a control uh, a group and some stroke patients, and we'll be studying these relationships of these signals.
yeah, that's exactly what we're planning on doing. This, this pilot clinical study is starting very soon, and that's, um, this is uh, very uh, recently finished. It was, the, it was last assembled uh, last week. <laughs> Uh, so it's very new. <laughs> it's a very new telescope, and we'll start using it as soon as we can. Um, with the data you showed, um, was there a difference in the right and left hemisphere in the deoxy or the back? Because I have a pretty good idea that the heart rhythm in the deoxy, um, there, there was residual. So if you, there you go. There you go. On the right hemisphere. <coughs> Yeah, uh, we, we did see that, and uh, the reason we didn't explore it is because uh, we need to do a, a lot more uh, signal processing, which we didn't have time to do, to really uh, see this. We do think that it's some crosstalk between uh, the, the, two, the two signals. Um, uh, we, we have uh, uh, one of the members of our lab is, is developing this algorithm to, to uh, online change the differential path length factor, and that should help uh, differentiate the crosstalk uh, uh, between these two signals and get us uh, a more realistic uh, result. So that's why I focused on that one. <laughs> well, I invite you just uh, to speak with the uh, presenters if you are interested. Thank you very much.